Um, so Debbie, are you still on? Can I hear you still? I, I'm here. I'm here. I'm hey. just, you know, listening to you. Well, well, yeah, they're used to it. Unfortunately for you guys, you don't have to listen to me much today. Um, <laughs> <laughs> so, Debbie, when we talked about this session, this idea period, you know, I don't know that you started out in this industry sort of with the intention of becoming this period makeup, like, icon, but you really have. Like, you, I think if I were making a period film that spanned decades, I'd be like, I don't know, who should I call it? Debbie Zoller. Um, yeah. <laughs> what, where in your career, at what point did you go from sort of being a film and TV makeup to somebody who really became this research and, and period makeup expert? That's a really good question. I wish you had given me that before. I could have actually given you a specific date. Yeah, um, I like to like throw some stuff at you. Yeah, I mean, you know, it's interesting because I think when you're in this business, you find things that uh, as you're working that you gravitate to. And I realized that I loved doing research. I loved doing period makeup because it, those, those eras are so iconic. Going, you know, all the way back to like, um, I did a project called North and South Three, which was based in the late 1800s. And that was all research. You know, you have to know what facial hair is appropriate and what the women's makeup looked like at that time. And that goes way back. And I was hand making facial hair because of all the background. And that kept me like, immersed in it and I just loved you know doing those kinds of period looks and that kind of work and I just enjoyed it so much that I guess from that 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 would have been the moment when my focus really you know was heightened as far as doing uh, period makeup and then somehow I seemed to gravitate to you know projects like Timeless and Mad Men and Fosse Verdon and you know, things that, uh, that I love that are, are all period work. And if you notice, so many projects now, like that new Hollywood show that's on um, uh, Netflix, um, you know, Ryan Murphy especially uh, seems to really love doing period projects. So, you know, I'm kind of grateful that Mad Men kind of started a, an amazing trend. Yeah. And was, there, you know, you do so many different things. You've worked with Reb Wilson and all these things on, on big films that weren't period necessarily, um, where it's like straight makeup or, you know, character makeup, a basic character makeup, basic character. Um, is, do you, is, is it more enjoyable for you to do something where you've got to do so much research and you've really got to dig into it and you've got to, the process, or is it more fun for you or more challenging for you to do just like a basic thing where you're just kind of doing a, a basic character. What, what What's well, your heart? I think I think every project has its challenges and I take each project because of that. But the one thing I had to laugh at when I was on, I think I was on Mad Men and January Jones had to go directly from set to uh, a red carpet function. And she's like, Debbie, would you mind, um, switching me, you know, doing my makeup for the red carpet. And I was like, sure. And it was the weirdest thing because my brain was so, it focused and enveloped in that period that when I took the makeup off and started putting her in a modern day, I almost like had brain freeze. <laughs> like, I was like, uh, how do I do this again? And she started laughing because she's like, are you having trouble? I go, no, I'm just shifting gears. You know, I have, to, you have to literally shift your brain into a whole different place. And I realized how immersed I was in doing period that in order for me to shift, I had to really like, you know, take a deep breath and go, okay, I can, I can go back to the present now. Because you literally eat, sleep, breathe, you know, period makeup. That's how I was on Mad Men. That's how I was on Timeless. That's how I was on Fosse Verdon. So, and we'll talk about some of the challenges that are specific to those projects as we kind of get into the, we'll pull up some PowerPoint. We got some great images for you guys to check out um, and Debbie to speak to. But, you know, a lot of our artists, uh, there's a, a, a good percentage who want to get involved in TV or film or are involved with theater like Joe. Mm -hmm. And then there's a lot of artists here who are really more, they're in the, the trenches, they're doing bridal, they're doing editorial. Mm -hmm. But these are also 
types of work where period influence comes into play. Mm -hmm. So can you speak a little bit to um, some, maybe some like Debbie Zoller's top three things you should be thinking about, it can be more or less than three, when you're creating a, a period look. So somebody says to Andrea Coherian, uh, something that she wants, they're doing a 20s wedding, or somebody mm -hmm. says to, you know, um, Angel that they're, they're, they're doing an editorial that they want to be very like 1800s uh, or Victorian inspired, right. meet Mad Max Thunder, you know, Beyond right. Thunderdome. Like, right. what are some tricks that you can recommend to our crew that would be helpful for them as they're starting to figure out how they can research period for something like bridal or editorial? Right. Well, especially for bridal, because there's a lot of women that want their makeup retro. They want to look like that 1950s, 1960s bride. So the things that are most important when you're doing a retro makeup that has changed in throughout the decades are the eyebrows specifically. The eyebrows were much thinner. They were very meticulously drawn on with a, an eyebrow pencil. There wasn't any of this gel liner. There wasn't any uh, powders came later in the later 60s, but uh, pencils were very, very meticulous and very arched. Um, you know, not like McDonald's arches, but they were very arched and very tapered, which is really important because that's the first thing with a, with a 1950s or 1960s brow. And then uh, you want the cream cheeks, which is just on the apples of the cheeks. And you wanna be very specific as far as the colors that you choose uh, for those periods, because there were very specific color palettes that were created you know, back in like the early 1920s. And so each period you'll notice has a different color palette. So depending on which color palette you choose, that will tell me, oh, this is a 1940s, this is a 1950s, this is a 1960s. So the 40s had the much deeper reds and no blush. So the red, the deeper like uh, cherry reds, maroon reds were the lip colors. Then when you move to the 50s, you still have some of those because you wanna bring that forward say in like an older woman, but the younger women would then wear more of like the rosy pink, uh, rosy pink or the peach tone on their cheeks and just on the apples. Um, and they would also utilize those same colors going into lip colors. So, and then 60s, you know, the early 60s was very similar to the 50s. And then once you get to the late 60s, that's when like, uh, Mary Quant and all of those uh, different European makeup artists and, and costumers, designers, fashion designers started wearing makeup and utilizing makeup in their uh, costume design and their wardrobes. And that's when colors started to getting a little more fun and a little more vibrant. So, you know, if you tell me that you want, a bride says to me, I want to look like a 1950s bride, then I know exactly it's the arched brow it's the pink or the rosy uh, or the, the cream uh, peachy cheeks. It's uh, the lip color could be in either red, a true red, a coral, or a pink. Not a blue pink, a true pink. Um, and then you can have a little bit of eyeliner. Uh, you can have a wing if you want a wing, but the under eye is very clean. And mascara and a very neutral eyeshadow. So besides the, the book that I think you should write that outlines all of this, which is not, by the way, the announcement she's going to make, although no. maybe I can talk to her and we'll figure that out. Besides that book, is there like a resource or, I mean, obviously we can Google 1950s makeup, but is there anything you use besides that kind of research? Any place you go to for stuff? Well, it's funny because I went to the manufacturers when I was doing Mad Men. I went directly to the manufacturers and asked them, like Revlon has a color, a nail polish color called Cherries in the Snow and Revlon Red that were all made during the 1950s. Mm. So those, those colors are still around. And then what I was doing was also doing research on some of the other colors that they had at that time. And they would help me try and find some of that research. I also went to some of the uh, studio research libraries I went uh, to magazines, Life Magazine, Look Magazine on eBay and bought a bunch of those. And they all have the ads in there that have all the colors of the eyeshadows 
and the lipsticks and the nail polish and they have the shape of the nails. That's what's so beautiful about it because you want to be period specific and you want your attention to detail. Yeah, and I never, I guess that's actually, what a great idea that is. It's like, you know, I don't know if you'd buy the rest of our crew, but I love like at Strand Book in New York or vintage bookstores going and picking up old magazines and finding old magazines and gathering them. That's got to be a great resource because you have the ads, you have the editorial, you have the cover, yeah. you have the celebrity. That's yeah. cool. Yeah. I, I have one more question that's a general question before we um, jump into some of the projects. Um, so you're working very closely with costume and hair and production and the, and the, and the writers and everything. What, you know, is there ever a point in time, because you are so meticulous, is there ever a, a time, and you don't have to mention the project, obviously, but where you've been sort of frustrated because you're like, no, I got this right and y'all are off and you're making my stuff look bad. Like, does that ever happen? Or is it the level of people, the level of a hairstylist, the level of costumer <laughs> on your projects are the type that are gonna get it just as well as you? You know me too well. <laughs> I do. <laughs> don't mention the project. Um, I will not. Yes, there have been times when things didn't quite match up. And it's at those times that you have to really take a step back and say, hey, maybe this person hasn't uh, done as much research as I have. Maybe they haven't uh, explored, they didn't have the time to explore some of the things that I have been doing my entire career. This could have been their first opportunity of doing a period project and they might not have understood how to get to that end result. And as opposed to saying, you know, stomping your feet and saying, this isn't right and you're making my work look bad, it's the opposite. It's how can I help you in this situation so that we all look good? Right. And that's really what it comes down to. You cannot do this job by yourself. You can't, you know, be a one man band and you have to know and learn how to work with everyone and how to get the best project and product that you can. Yeah, I mean, it makes a lot of sense. And honestly, that, that advice really um, resonates with sort of every area of work for, for our audience here. You know, it doesn't matter if you're working on a, again, it doesn't have to be a period, right? It doesn't have to be right. a period editorial. Right. That, that's, the, that's the sort of messaging. And I think, you know, also to understand, and it's something I always try to teach, especially when I'm working with student groups, is understand who the actual decision maker is on the project. Right, right. And make sure they're comfortable and they're happy with the work and make sure they're the one you're going right. to because everyone's got an opinion. Right. That and Debbie Zoller came over to me and said, that pin curl is really a 1949, not a 1953. <laughs> and you're like, back off, I know my pin curls. Right. But who's the decision maker and right. where do you go to make sure you have that support? So that's awesome. Right. Um, we could talk all day. And, and y'all, as you guys know, if you have to sign off, we apologize that we talk are long-winded, but we're just going to keep talking until we feel like talking. So we'll be about an hour. <laughs> might be a little longer because Debbie likes to talk like I do. Have people signed off already? Am I that boring? <laughs> no, nobody has signed off. We keep getting more. In fact, somebody is giving out this link because I didn't give some of these people the link. I know who you are, by the way. Okay, so I'm going to share my screen. Um, and then we're going to, so again, just as a reminder to everybody, as we share screens, um, my recommendation is try to go to the most minimal amount of external visibility so that you can see the work and see the images. So click on maybe it's speaker view, or you can go to the, um, the thumbnail video, or if you do the grid, that's great too. And I know that it's also different on phones and iPads and computers. I personally, just so you guys know, I always recommend if you can use a laptop or a computer for these Zooms, especially when you're gonna be seeing work and images and somebody doing makeup, it makes it a, lot, a big difference. So um, Debbie, yeah, you have a lot of work. First off, how many years you've been doing this just for fun? I'm coming up on 30. I will be 30 years in 2022. Amazing. I know, it's crazy. Now I can't see myself, is that correct? Uh, you can if you if you click on your little thing on the right. Remember, I taught you the other day. There's a little um, share, share scroll screen. over to where it's at. Right, if it probably says talking the powder group right now. 
Yes. Scroll above that and then you mm -hmm. can click on the, the box next to it and it'll say speaker view and it'll show me right now. And then it'll show you when gotcha. you speak. Okay. Okay. Or you can click on the other one. Um, okay. So I'm going to jump right into these because we've got a lot to talk about. Um, <laughs> Madman. I mean, who loves Madman? Raise your hands. I'm like, oh, amazing. It is, I think it changed so much about the way people um, think about what can be expected from from a project like that. I mean, it was mm -hmm. really one of the first things that was out there that was that level of, of really like the intensity of the storyline, everything that was about so period, it was really beautiful. And the, the, vis the visual energy of it was amazing. Were there any, and how did you get involved with it first of all? And were there any very specific challenges with that project? Um, I got called, <laughs> challenges, my God, the whole thing. I was on a project in North Carolina and I was doing that project and I got called from a production manager that I worked with. And he said, Debbie, I'm doing this show and I think it's right up your alley. And I was like, okay. And he said, we have to set up a, a phone meeting. Obviously we didn't have this at that time. And I said, sure, no problem. Uh, and it kept, the phone meeting kept getting delayed and this, project I was on in North Carolina was crazy. And so the whole day they kept calling and saying, he's busy, we'll call you back. And I'm like, okay, so now at this point, it's the end of the day, I'm in my car, I'm driving uh, back to my apartment. And sure enough, the phone rings. So I have to quickly pull over because I didn't want to be talking on the phone while I'm driving. And that Good was, lesson. Good. You know, lesson. that was what, 2007. So I uh, pulled over, I found a parking lot and I pulled over and I was talking to the director, the executive producer, the writer, who was all the same person and my friend who was the production manager. And he's like, why do you want this job? You know, the typical interview. And, you know, I uh, tried to answer as, as best as I could. I had very little research that I could do. They didn't send me a script. They didn't send me anything. So I had to really um, think on my feet. And what ended up happening was, is uh, I could hear them all talking in the back. And he's like, so are you, uh, are, are you ready to come and do this job? Are you really wanted? Or, you know, is, is there anything that you uh, want to tell us? And I said, well, to be quite honest with you, I said, I'm a Jew in North Carolina. And I look up and I'm sitting in a Walmart parking lot. And I said, please get me out of here. <laughs> and he, the director and the executive producer, who was the same person, turned to his friends, to the, all the people in the, in the office, and he said, she's hired. <laughs> so, you know, it just goes to show you, if you have a little sense of humor, you never know what's going to happen. That's awesome. I love that. Yeah. Um, let's jump right into pictures because we've got so many. And, and okay. I'm going to apologize in advance because some of the images are a little bit grainy. I didn't realize it. So I pulled them up again this morning, but I think they're going to be great on, um, on most of our folks things. So let's just talk. This was also a show for me that, I mean, when you look at this, it's, it, I was talking with Aaron the other day about Hollywood. And I said, you know, the men are as pretty and as polished yep. Yep. As, as the women. Yep. Um, and it's not because they look made up, but what are the tricks? And we're going to be featuring Hollywood on, um, in on Makeup Magazine this coming issue. Yeah. So, you know, that was a really interesting um, thought. But then I was looking at this and I went, well, Mad Men is exactly that, right? These are men who are polished and primped and put together, flawless skin. Mm -hmm. You know, for me, this was as much about male makeup and grooming as it was about the women's. Um, can you talk a little bit about the process you go through with something like this, it's period, but it's also a lot of men. Right. Um, the one thing with this period in the early 50s was that everyone's skin was really beautiful and it had a very peaches and cream kind of uh, reflection to it. If you notice, it's like they're not matte completely, no. but yet at the same time, they look flawless. And that was really what was so important to achieve not only with the women, but with the men as well. And in what are, some, what are like, and I know that the, the products that you use probably have shifted a little bit and since Mad Men, but can you remember back to like, what was, what was like your go-to foundation for the yeah. male actors on this? For the men, it was the Laura Mercier oil-free moisturizer that had a tint okay. and it came in so many beautiful colors. 
Uh, the men also, we had to shave twice a day. They would come in in the morning, we would shave them. Didn't matter if they shaved the night before, we had to make sure they were clean shaven that morning. And then after lunch, we would do after lunch touch-ups, we would shave them again, put the makeup back on. Wow. And on top of that Laura Mercier, believe it or not, I would use uh, the Lancome uh, dual finish powder. Okay. Um, not with a, a puff, you know, pressing it in, but with a brush. So it wasn't as heavy, but it gave it that really beautiful matte look. Yet at the same time, you can see that they still have life to their skin. Yeah. Well, that's what I think is so special about it is that it doesn't look flat. It's right. not, you know, you know, four camera th uh, sitcom, you know, makeup is one thing and then cinematography and, and beautifully shot like film makeup is so different and this I think these projects that while they're all television projects they all are shot like a movie is and they're yeah they're and it was shot on film this was yeah. before everything it changed was. to digital yeah Maybe. yeah so I mean um, it was just beautiful so as we go through a couple of these we've got some beautiful images of some of the female um, characters talk mm -hmm. a little bit about this because what I think is really interesting you mentioned earlier is understanding from a period makeup standpoint did that lipstick color exist yeah when you you know when you were in it so what these this is like perfect to me it's exactly kind of what you talked about earlier about 50s makeup mm -hmm. and it's interesting because you i really had to figure out which color lipsticks existed which color nail polish existed and i had to take that information to the executive producer and prove it to him there was no fudging you know, so I got all my research down, got all the colors, then had to go out to all the different makeup lines and try and find colors that best matched those. And sometimes I would have to mix a couple just to get that right tone, you know, the depth or the sheerness or whatever. But um, that was really important. He would not let anything go. And we had to do every person that went on camera had to have a makeup hair wardrobe test the day before they shot. And then he would approve it. And then they would come back the next day and we would either do what we did or we would make some changes, whatever he wanted. What was, um, because these, this is a very, I mean, most are, but this is a very um, costume heavy show, um, wardrobe heavy show. What was your process any different with this because of the, again, those ideas of like this, these shades did, rec did work you know, your process is so, again, meticulous that um, I imagine it doesn't really shift that much, but was there any challenge to the, to the costume? Well, I would always check with the costume designer the day before any of the girls were shooting to make sure, you know, what their color palette was because she establishes that color palette for each character. Mm -hmm. Basically, you, you know, you establish a closet of clothing for each character. And what I did, um, like January Jones was based after Grace Kelly, uh, her looks, um, if you go back to that previous uh, photo. And then Joan, um, you can see kind of the Grace Kelly influence here. Um, and then Joan in this next photo was based after two uh, beautiful models from the 50s and 60s, um, Susie Parker, and uh, what was the other one? Um, uh, Shrimpton, Jean Shrimpton, Shrimpton, those two. So again, when I was collecting like the Look magazines and uh, the Life magazines, you would see these women and I would then do research on them to see who they were. And then I found more pictures of them and I was able to kind of design a makeup look for each of these characters based on a real person that existed during that time. How much, um, because how many, how many years in, um, in movie life did the series cover? Um, well, when I was there, it went from nine, well, it started in the early 50s, like 53. And then by the time I left, it was 65. Okay. And then we had flashbacks within that. So there were 1940s, there was 1920s, um, there was also World War I. So we, there were many flashbacks within those episodes as well. That's amazing. All right, we're gonna go another one of January, because that's a beautiful shot. So their, their personalities really, um, 
I mean, you can tell even when you look at this, this shot or this one, you know, there, as, as is the case today or any period, makeup tells you so much about someone's class and social mm -hmm. socioeconomic status. Um, were there any challenges with that with regard to how you kind of made a point of difference between characters based on those factors? Well, yes, because the women, like all the secretaries, you know, didn't have a lot of money but they would spend their lunch hour looking at magazines and trying to emulate those looks. Mm -hmm. You know, this was also based in New York. So, you know, women were much more, uh, had the attention to detail of wanting to look, you know, when they walked out of the house, they had their hair done, they had their makeup on, they had their nails done, or if they were a secretary, they kept their nails very short, you know, because they were, they were typing. That's what they did all day. So you have to take into consideration the job that these women were leaving the house to go and do. And also for someone like Joan, I mean, you know, she was just such a bombshell in that office and in charge of all the secretaries that I, of course, wanted her to stand out more so than the other ones. Mm -hmm. That's great. Another shot here, more male grooming. Yeah. Amazing. And you know, when you're doing men, you're also grooming their eyebrows too. You know, they, you don't want ear hair, you don't want nose hair, you, you know, you want their eyebrows groomed, not obviously tweezed, uh, you don't want them to look, you know, too feminine. But you can see that, you know, everyone was, their facial hair was very tailored. Yeah. Like in Fosse, <laughs> which we'll talk about later. Right. Um, I love this shot because again, it's like, you look at like, you, like you talk about bombshells, you talk about that status that they have. Right. Um, just what was the most fun thing about working on Mad Men? You know, I think um, the transition when these actors walked in and they were, you know, in their current 2007, 2008 looks, 2009. And then once they walk out of the trailer and they put their costume on and you see the transition that you just immerse yourself in it, you believe that they are really from that era. And I think that was the thing that was most special to me. And I, would, I had phone calls from a lot of people because this was such a groundbreaking show. Uh, and we didn't know what was going to happen. We didn't know if it was going to be critically acclaimed or people were going to hate it. We had no idea. Um, but we put our all into it. And I think it just really paid off. And just looking at this, at this photo with all the smiles on their faces makes me really happy. Yeah, it's great. I'm sure alcohol and cigarette sales also went through the roof oh, yeah. during this show because it was oh, yeah. all they did. And during the shooting of it. <laughs> I'm sure. Um, la the last two pictures in, the, in, in Mad Men, I wanted to talk about her because she's so, such a special character. And yeah. again, someone who had such um, passion and drive. Yes. But yet was in this secretarial role and right. you saw shifting in her. Talk a little bit about that. So uh, the Peggy character, again, came from, you know, a very working class family. She had ambition beyond. She wanted to be like the female that made it in the male world. And she did everything she possibly could to uh, work towards that goal. She was very focused and very ambitious. And I, I'm hope, you know, I can't say I'm giving you a spoiler alert because it's been 10 years. But um, <laughs> um, if you so, haven't seen the show yet, turn away. Yeah. <laughs> so her character at the end of the first season or during the season starts eating donuts. You start seeing her in the lunchroom or the break room and she's eating donuts. And you think that she's just getting heavy and because under stress of working in this male dominated world. And then if you switch to the next photo, you'll see, see how uh, this is what we did. We had three uh, different fat makeups, if that's what you want to call it, or weight gain makeups. Um, we, you know, filled out her face and uh, her neck, and then you would see it, uh, her body would fill out more. And we had three different stages that we did this in. But what ultimately was the issue is that she was pregnant and she was trying to cover up that pregnancy because she was pregnant out of wedlock. And that was something that, again, in the 50s, you know, that wasn't uh, a popular thing to do. 
you well, usually especially for a woman who's trying yeah. to make it in a man's world, right? right. A man's world, that right. would be the 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 end of that. That's awesome. And I didn't realize that having seen the show, like I like it didn't cue to me that it was a, a weight gain makeup until mm -hmm. you explained it. And I was like, oh wow. Like you yeah. just kind of it not to blow smoke, but it's you're it's so good that you're kind of just believe it as the character. So right, it's, it's, right. It's and I had a, I had a great team. I had Joel Harlow and Brian Pinnacus helping me, you know, with this because you know we were under the gun getting this done. We had to get it done really fast because uh, Matt, the director producer, kind of forgot to tell me about it. Um, it was something that came up in a in a writer's room meeting that I happened to be involved with, like, cause he would have all of the department heads sit in the various meetings so that we could understand what was going on in the next episode. And all of a sudden I was like, what, what, what? <laughs> and that's when we realized, oh, because we didn't know, he didn't tell us. Wow. So it was, you know, a very fast, um, it came together beautifully, uh, you know, with Joel and, and Brian, and they really, uh, the three of us really pulled it off. It, it sounds like having really talented friends who like helping you out is yeah. a really good thing. I was so grateful, <laughs> yeah. Again, you know, you can't do this by yourself, right. so, yeah. yeah. Let's talk about this. I, this, first of all, because I'm a Cabaret fan, and I'm a Fosse fan, and I'm a Gwen Verdon fan, and so for me, this project, I couldn't wait. And we were fortunate. Thank you for letting us feature it in on Makeup Magazine in the print issue. But also, it's just talking to you about it. It's so I'm like, it's so fascinating to me because the process was, I know this, this project took you how long to research? I had three months. I was hired in August. I flew to New York in September. We uh, luckily pushed six weeks because no one was ready, because it was such a huge undertaking. Um, so our first day of shooting was October 31st on uh, Halloween. So oh, wow. I luckily had uh, like 10, 12 weeks of, uh, of prep and had a, an amazing group of New York makeup artists that also helped me in uh, with a lot of the setup because it like going through all those different uh, musicals and then, you know, just the daily lives of all these people and the aging and the de-aging. Um, it was, it was a huge, huge <laughs> undertaking. And this was how many decades spanned in this production? 40 years. 40 years. Yeah. All right. So this is some of the earlier stuff. Yeah, this is the younger, this is where we used lifts, uh, cosmetic lifts under their wigs to, you know, help with the, the uh, aging, to de-age them, to make them look younger. And I don't know if you guys have ever used those, but you know, that's an old Hollywood trick. Uh, the Mark Trainer uh, lifts are really pretty amazing. Uh, I know in a lot of photo shoots they use them and then they can uh, uh, airbrush them out. Yeah. Um, but you know, if somebody has long hair, like you can hide them behind- So wait, your... I could use them? Yeah. <laughs> you can hide them behind the neck, you know, and you can pull. Oh, I wish I could do that right now. Let's do that later. I should have. All right. Yeah. You'll see the difference. Yeah. But, you know, those are tricks that are just amazing. And it's just tape with a with an elastic. Yeah. It's pretty cool. Some more of these. Yeah. And this is when they're a little older. This is uh, more 70s, 1970s. And when you're doing research for a project like this, you know, there's where these are, it's not fictional characters, they're historical figures, they're historical right. people that people are alive and hanging out and they know they knew them and they knew the project and they knew right. their personality. I mean, we look at films that feature, you know, that tell the story of someone and inevitably someone goes, that's not the story. That's not who they were. That's not how they look. That's not what... Right. What, what are the things that you do as you're, you're thinking about this, this evolution of characters? Because obviously, you know, Gwen and, and Fosse both, they evolved as, as personalities and humans right, right. as the, the decades passed on, as they became more successful, as they became bigger stars. 
So what would you say are some of those things? Do you ever talk to the people who are around? Like, how does that Oh, work? yeah. Um, their daughter was one of our producers. And she was a, an amazing wealth of knowledge and allowed us uh, private access into um, the, it's called the Verdon Fosse uh, legacy. And so we were able to look at specific photos, like family photos that have never been printed or shown into the public. So that was such a gift in, in its own. It was amazing. Was, and, she, was she happy with the results of where everything oh, landed? She was, she, yeah, Nicole is her name. She is beside herself happy. And, you know, she would come into the trailer and she would tell us like, you know, these little stories about her mom and putting on her own lipstick and, you know, uh, things like that. And when her mom would make her up to make her look older so that she could sneak in her into the hospital, you know, things like that. So there were some real gems that we were, that we were privy to that nobody else was. And, you know, also Michelle and Sam uh, did so much research on these characters that, you know, they also had very strong opinions of what they wanted. And so, you know, it was my job to kind of have the research and balance that research with their, you know, wants and desires as far as their character is concerned. Does that happen often where the, the actor performing as a, I mean, whether it's fictional or realistic, I guess you, or, or historical, I guess you could have the same problem, but especially where it's historical and they're like, no, yeah. I did the research, I know. Does that happen more often yeah. than we think? Yes, yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Um, it, you know, again, you are uh, the catalyst of this, of this job and, but it's your job to make them happy as well. Um, and to listen to when they say, you know, can you change the arch of my brow? Can you, uh, can we uh, change my teeth? Um, things like that, that, you know, Michelle wanted um, dentures to change her, her bite and to change her teeth, which I was so happy about. And so, you know, it's, like I said, it's it's uh, a work in progress. We had a lot of makeup tests uh, to get you know things really specific. Um, the lashes were really uh, for each era for them changed you know with with every era. Um, you know everything was meticulously researched. Um, again, it was like working on Mad Men, yeah. and so I feel like Mad Men prepared me for this job. So you can see the teeth there. Yeah. So, and you know, Bob Fosse started losing his hair in his twenties when I think he was 25 and he started losing his, his hair. And he was always very uh, self-conscious about that. So, you know, that's something that we also tried, you know, that emotional lack of hair. Uh, we also tried to bring that into the character as well. When you're working with um, aging, you know, that we know that the facelift and, and we go through four decades here and there's a long period of time. And here we start to see more facial hair. You start to see the skin look different. Um, first off, is this his or facial hair? Is this laid beard or his beard? Um, this particular one is his beard. The way we had to shoot it, Sam grew his beard out in the very beginning. We shot a, like the first, three episodes, I think, all, two or three, all with his beard. And then we had to go revert back to him younger in those prior uh, photos. So he shaved off his beard. We shot all that. I had a beard made that matched his beard so that as he grew his beard back in, I am now putting the lace back beard that I had made over his real beard that was coming, that was growing in. It was the craziest situation I have ever been in. Wow. And I kept saying, uh, praying to God, I, please God, let me pull this off. <laughs> well, let's look at some more beard shots. Oh, uh, before we get to more beards, I mean, this is one of my favorite shots yeah. of, this, of this whole thing. When yeah. you're doing a, a, a film, 
of a, it's like the play within the play within the play. Like right. there's a, fa there's an actual production that this is based on. Right. Are you, are you going in and just looking at, pick, I'm not dismissing the skill set, but are you going, I've got to make it look exactly like that? Or is there any interpretation? There, there was no interpretation. Right. It was exact. The, the costume designer got the exact fabric, the hair exact, the makeup exact. And the problem is, is that the, you know, this being 1968, uh, the graininess of any photos that you could find were really tough. And thank God for those makeup artists that I had in New York, because each one of these ladies would come in for a fitting. They came in for their wardrobe fitting. They would then go to hair, get their hair fit because they had to get a, a wig that matched exactly to uh, Sweet Charity. And then they would come and get their makeup done and we would pull specific lashes. We would pull the foundation. We would you know, make, make sure everything matched so that these ladies looked exactly like the original. Amazing. And I'm happy to say, I think we achieved it. But those, the makeup artists that I had, Sherry and Nikki and Allende and Angela Johnson and, um, oh God, Andrew Sotomayor. I mean, some of the most amazing, Jessica, uh, the most amazing makeup artists that I was so fortunate to have in my arsenal because they brought so much artistic, you know, ability. I, I, it was, it was stunning. It was really stunning because I haven't worked in New York for so long that a lot of my contacts were, you know, have retired or they weren't available because they were on other jobs. So I had to really throw my trust out there. And these guys were absolutely amazing. Awesome. I think some of those also, some of them, I'm not being a smart ass, some of them also worked on Pose. So yes. this might've been a really good practice because this yes. is very like fabulous. Yeah. All right, let's yeah. see another one. This is an amazing shot. Yeah, I took this picture. This is one of my favorite, favorite pictures uh, from Cabaret. Yeah. Amazing. I loved it. Loved it. And we were doing in the same week, Sweet Charity and Cabaret. So to do those two huge iconic uh, looks were amazing. And if you notice here, all of them have eyebrow covers on. Um, if you go back to the last one with mm -hmm. Kelly, who plays yeah. Liza Minnelli. Oh, this one. Yeah, Kelly has actual prosthetic eyebrow covers on because she has really thick eyebrows. And you know, back in the 70s when they did this, all of the dancers basically either shaved or tweezed their eyebrows way down wow. to fit that look. Because uh, this is based in the 30s. So this is now a 30s brow. And of course, you know, no one was going to do that. So, you know, we did the old uh, drag queen, you know, uh, glue stick. stick. Yeah. And Bondo and uh, uh, um, uh, Pax paints. And, but on Kelly, we actually did prosthetic eyebrow covers. Amazing, beautiful. Some more, this is as they get, they're getting a little older during this time. This is yeah. towards the end as well. Yeah, yeah. This was uh, Sweet Charity, that was Cabaret. Yeah. Yeah, and this was, uh, oh God, which one was that? Sorry, I'm blanking right now. And this is the last shot in this segment. And and when you're, is this her daughter? Yeah, this is the uh, this is the girl that is actually playing Nicole, who is the daughter. And this was a uh, part of the show where uh, they had to make her up to look older so that she could go into the hospital and visit her dad, who had just had a, a heart attack. Oh, amazing! Yeah. I keep saying the word amazing and I'm like, well, it's amazing. <laughs> um, this is the last one. This was the yeah. old, age, the aged and aging one. I think right. this was a continuity picture, right? Right. This is right. just something off that I took off the monitor. Um, and this kind of shows a really nice close up of the texture, you know, of his skin. Um, this is a fake beard. This is a beard, you know, over a beard kind of situation. 
Um, these are prosthetic eyebrow or uh, prosthetic eye bags, upper and lower. Um, a lot of stretch and stipple from uh, Bluebird. Um, just changing the texture of the skin, um, stuff like that. Amazing, amazing. Twin Peaks, oh, <laughs> amazing. So, okay. is anybody bored? I just want to make sure they're not no bored. bored. Trust okay. me. If I'm not bored, they're not bored because you know I don't really care about makeup. Okay. Um, <laughs> so, talk to me about this and and how you got involved with this, because you had worked with David Lynch before, right? Yeah, I've worked with David off and on for 20 years. Um, I started with him in 1996. Wow. So when, you know, I found out about this like everybody else did. Uh, I was at work on a job, and I was looking at my phone, because that's what you do in the trailer, and up on Twitter came uh, a little announcement from him. Uh, and I literally jumped out of my seat and ran outside and immediately called uh, the office where his producer, uh, Sabrina, works. And, you know, I've, I've maintained a relationship with all of these people for 20 years. And I called her and I said, Sabrina, is there something you neglected to tell me? And uh, she started laughing. And she said, yeah, you know, we're going to get around to calling everybody. And I said, well, please, God, you know, I don't know what it is you're doing, but please make sure you call me. And she said, don't worry, Debbie, we will. And that's when I found out it was Twin Peaks. You just kind of insisted upon the job. I like that. I like oh, yeah. that about you. Oh, yeah. There was no question. This was, this was my job. Yeah. So we'll go through these. I want to um, talk overall about the project. But um, really, for, I think that for so many people who, who love the original, you know, of course, there's so much passion involved with something where you're bringing something back after so many years. Mm -hmm. What were some of those challenges that you had where you're taking someone who we didn't see for so long mm -hmm. and thinking to yourself, well, this is what they'd be like now. Like, what were some of those challenges for you? Well, David, David, in my opinion, the way that I, when I approach David's projects is that everything new is old and everything old is new. So chomp on that for a minute because therein lies how I approach uh, my makeups. Um, they may be 25 years older, but they still look a little bit like they're in the past. And then, you know, you have people like Naomi's character who, you know, they didn't have a lot of money. Uh, you know, her husband at the time was, you know, seeing hookers and gambling and had issues. Um, so you have to approach each character based on, you know, what their vibe is and, and what, they're, what they bring to the show. And you have to understand, I was not allowed to have a script. So I had to read this from, you know, front to back, back to front 15 times. Um, and design each character from memory. So that was a bit difficult. And each actor only knew a little bit about their role based on what David told them because they didn't have a script either. And I was not allowed to talk to one actor about another actor's character. So it was very restricted. It was very hush-hush. I couldn't have any uh, continuity photos up in the trailer. I always had to make sure they were in a special Dropbox in my phone. Um, and then I had to design three characters for Kyle, one of them being, you know, Agent Cooper, but then the other two were his doppelgangers. And here's a shot of all three. Right. <clears throat> right. And, you know, again, David likes things very simple. He, uh, was like, Debbie, I don't want to spend the time with prosthetics because we have to shift back and forth uh, throughout these characters. So, um, you know, like with Kyle, I made, he he's supposed to look like he just kind of exists in the earth. Um, you know, he doesn't sleep, he has no home, he's just there. So I made him, you know, tanner, weathered, dirty. We darkened his eyes with contacts. Um, gave him teeth that were, uh, you know, looked dirtier um, and, and the longer hair. And then I, I just thought, you know, I loved it. I just thought it was great. Kind of greasy, shiny. 
Um, and then uh, the one on the right, uh, which I loved, um, we put in a prosthetic uh, um, plumpers on the inside to plump him out because his character, that character was much heavier. Was that under, that was, so that wasn't a prosthetic, it's something you put inside his jaw? Put inside, in yeah. In the mouth, wow. Yeah, yeah. I'm just gonna scroll through some of the shots just from a, a period standpoint. This is really special. I remember we talked about this one and creating this look. Talk about this a little bit. Um, this was hard for me because Diane was a character that no one had ever seen before. She was only over the phone and, you know, a voice. So I, I was, had my thoughts, you know, but again, you know, David and Laura are such close friends and she is his muse. So I kind of came in at the end of their discussion. Um, they just talked about the costumes of what she would wear. They kind of had an Asian influence to it. And then um, the hairstylist was brought in and they decided on this uh, cut and color of the hair. And I was kind of the last one to come and fill in the blanks. And the only thing David said to me was that he wanted like a, a candy, a cotton candy pink lipstick. And it was fascinating to me because I don't associate pink with David when I'm, when I, when we're talking colors. And so that was really interesting. I must have spent three days, three full days with Laura mixing different color lipsticks. And because she smokes so much, you know, I had to, I had to try and make sure that, uh, you know, her character, uh, I had to try and make sure that the lipstick stayed on, you know, so that you still had that pink. But when it came to her character, I had the Asian eye influence where I had that wing and um, these little eyelashes that I would stick on that I would cut up different styles and add those onto her. But the makeup itself was very monochromatic and I, I just loved it. I thought it came out, I was very happy with it. I was gonna, I was gonna ask you what the that lipstick shade was, but that's impossible since it's, it's impossible. Yeah. <laughs> Nine shades. Yeah. Three days is a long time. I'm going to keep scrolling through some more yeah. just for everybody to take a look. This is a really interesting makeup. Talk about that. This was um, NATO. Uh, her character was based on another movie that David did called Inland Empire. And he wanted to bring this character back, and she was in the other world and she could not see. And this is a full prosthetic. There is no holes in it. Um, she is completely blind in this. And I love this look. I love this character because David actually helped Richard Redlifson and I uh, sculpt it. So Richard, who is, you know, my triple threat uh, of a makeup artist, he does, you know, beauty and prosthetics and you name it, facial hair. He's, he's, Brilliant, and he he sculpted this on her head her head cast that we sent over to uh, Vincent Van Dyke, who did the cast, and uh, Richard started sculpting it, and then we would bring it to set, or David would come into the trailer at the end of the night, and he would put his hands into it because he's a sculptor and an artist himself, and this was the end result, and he loved the hills and valleys of this look. And uh, at the last minute, he wanted it shiny. So we would hand David some KY jelly and he would mush that all over the front of it. You can kind of see the shine on there. And um, he also, at the last minute, wanted skin protruding out of it with these um, uh, stitches. So that was also, uh, I would hand lay those in there uh, on each prosthetic. And we did this prosthetic 16 times. So we could never reuse them. So uh, I had to create, you know, exactly the the skin that was protruding out because um, if David looked at it and said it doesn't match, then I'd have to go back and fix it. Just another day in Debbie's older life. Yeah. <laughs> just some more, just some more shots. We can go quickly through these. Yeah. 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 Amanda, she's amazing. That's his beard, right? 
that's his beard. Okay. But we did have to double him. So I had to uh, get, get a double one for him. Oh. Yeah. Oh, you found a lot. Oh, you can see you can see how there's kind of a retro, yeah. like an aged uh, a look, like time period, but yet at the same time you don't know what time period it is. Yeah. So that was my favorite. She also has eyebrow covers on. Well, what the was same, that the was... same ones that I used on uh, Kelly? Oh, uh, timeless. This was really cool. This one, um, I thought, you know, as somebody who loves creating period makeup, this must have been a really cool project because it's all that, right? You're in every episode, you're going from modern to yeah. fast and all over the place. So yeah. what was, what, what is that like? And how does this, a project like this shoot since it changes all the time? Well, Abigail Spencer was the lead in this show and she called me personally and said, Debbie, I think that, you know, you are the person we need for this job. She did this, the first season was done in Canada and they got the tax credit. So they were able to bring this show back. And the minute she found that out, she called me because she said, this is right up your alley because it's present day and also uh, back in time because they time traveled. So um, I loved this show. Uh, it was the, one of the hardest jobs I'd ever had because I broke my foot in the middle of it. Yeah. And uh, I tried to leave and they wouldn't let me. <laughs> so I was, you know, tooling around with a, a broken foot and a boot on, which was not easy. So I had to have people drive me to work because we were filming either on a soundstage or way out in uh, the mountains, out in Santa Clarita. And it was pouring rain. It was the middle of the winter. And I'd walk out with a plastic garbage bag over my boot. Um, it was really, really hard, but um, I really enjoyed it. But you know, being on a television schedule and going through all those different time periods was uh, chaos. Yeah. But um, because of my background, I was able to utilize some, <clears throat> some of my previous picture morgues, as I referred to before. Um, you know, I save all of that stuff. So I can go back and access photos from, you know, 50s, 60s, 70s, 1800s, 1700s, because I've kept all of that. Mm -hmm. Again, for the book that we're going right. to do, right? This yeah. is a fake beard. Um, I think on this day, Gabe DeCunto laid this beard in 15 minutes. Wow. I mean, it was a, these guys, uh, this particular photo was them coming back from the future. It's their future selves coming back to help them. I, I'm going to, uh, uh, in full transparency, prior to us talking about this the first time, I had never seen Timeless. And I got so caught up in this, having a discussion with you about it a year ago that I was like, I've got to watch this. It's a brilliant show. Isn't it? Yeah. It's a brilliant show. So if you guys have not seen it yet, you should do your best to try to find um, some yeah. episodes. I'm not sure it's on Netflix or whatever, but um, there's a couple of shots of yours and a couple of production shots in here just to talk to you quickly. Sure. Yeah. This was 1940s. The only thing that was difficult was the facial hair for the guys, but because they came from the future or the present into different time periods, uh, like there were times when we couldn't adjust their facial hair. And so we just kind of let it go. <laughs> what are you going to do? Artistic license. Yeah. Sometimes we would try and fill it in. Sometimes we would try and cover it up, you know, like this was, uh, this was 1950s. You know, and sometimes we would lengthen their sideburns, shorten their sideburns, things yeah, like that. Yeah, I'm noticing the brow too throughout mm -hmm. all of the, uh, of her in particular. Yeah. Um, and it's She's such not a the chameleon. Yeah, it's amazing. We're doing, um, Eugenia Weston is doing a session for us in early June. Oh, one great. of our making up with sessions. And she's actually going to be doing uh, something on the history of brows. So she'll talk a little bit about oh, great. it. So super fascinating to hear that. So I hope you guys can tune in for that. I think it's June 4th as well. Yeah. Also free for TV yeah. pro members and 706 and 700. Yeah, that's great. Um, this was great. I love these when you go back farther. Yeah. Now, yeah. How, now, when you're doing these, obviously in these periods, there, weren't, there wasn't makeup. They weren't wearing makeup, right? Right. So, um, so the idea is to make them look as natural as possible. Really, yeah. So like a men's grooming on all the women too, really. Right. 
look, I'm so, like, I'm, I'm a makeup artist. Right. I figured it out. Right. Um, she's amazing. Yeah. And you can, like, I love this because she, you know, as an actress, she's like, I want to see my freckles. You know, I, I love that look. It's natural. I mean, of course, we had to put mascara on them, you know, because it's television, you know. But you, the, rest, the rest of it is, is really, uh, is quite good. I also feel like, again, when you're creating characters, like she's clearly a, like a, a frontier woman. Like she's, you right. know she is, number one costume and hair, but like her skin looks like she's in the sun, like she's right. outside. And yeah. that's the thing is that they all came from the present day back to whatever time period we were in. So they, their characters would try and adapt and blend in as, as well as they could. Yeah. This was uh, 70s. It's amazing. I love. Do you ever, going back to this real quick though, so I, I'm, I'm gonna call you out on that. You're gonna be like, no, Michael, fuck you. But like, so you like, you, you do like 40s, 50s. Do you ever go like, oh, this character, she can be Gwen from the 70s and Fossey, I'll pull that makeup design out and you kind of work from something you've done before or are you always starting from scratch? Um, I will go back and use my references, uh, but I'll never copy something exact, right. if that makes sense. Because I always want it fresh and new, but I will go back to, to my references and say, oh, these were the colors I used, this was, you know, the look I used, things like that. So, but I will always uh, adapt it to each actor specifically. Nice. So I'll never copy one and just put it on another face. That should, that out of order, sorry. It's okay. <laughs> I love these as well. Yeah, me too. Yeah. So I could talk all day about all this and I do. I know, parts, my God. I know. <laughs> and I want, I told you, if you go quick. And then um, I also wanted to, um, like, I went through and I was like, oh, I want to talk about this and this. And I'm like, no, 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 we'll leave them something for later when we do something else live together. Okay. Okay. Um, so I'm going to stop the share so we can go back to that. Good luck with this, guys. Let's, oh, I did it. Look. Oh, my God. I'm so impressed with myself sometimes. That um, hi, Devin. Devin popped up. I didn't see him before. Hey, you're right there. Um, so, <laughs> you see a lot more than I do. I can't see any of that. No, you, I, I got to teach you the other. It's okay. It's less distract. Oh, shit. Did I just do that again? What? what? Hang on. Okay, there I go. Sorry. <laughs> I didn't mean to swear, guys. <laughs> um, I'm going to go into here and I'm going to go in here. I'm going to pull something up. So Debbie, number one, thank you. Um, fascinating and super. Thank you. Super I hope cool. it was interesting and not like. Um, not like. <laughs> all, first of all, um, do you guys, were you asleep? Did I have to wake anybody up? Are we good? We all right? Okay. Amazing. Thank you. We love thank, you. Thank you. <clears throat> So Debbie, I teased a little bit and said that you have a special announcement okay. that you wanted to talk about while we were on this Zoom call. Yeah. Um, and, and I think if, uh, some of our folks may have been on um, V's session the other day, which was so generous of her to do the amazing session at Friends. I know. Um, some might have heard a little peep about this. It was a little bit, um, not quite exactly what the project is, but I wanted you to share that. So you guys, you're the very first to hear this from Debbie Zoller's mouth. Yeah. Amazing project that she's going to be doing. Uh, and for those of you who are looking to get into television and film and who are not yet in the union, I want you to pay extra, extra special close attention. So Debbie, um, go ahead and share with us what you're, what you're working on. Okay. Well, what I've created is something called the Mentors Project. And I was getting a lot of phone calls from artists that when this pandemic hit, that they had been working towards, you know, their days to get into the union and doing, you know, non-union projects and doing everything that they can because they want to uh, either do beauty or makeup effects or any kind of, you know, makeup, even working in a lab, you know, cause some of the labs now uh, are turning union. And the problem is with this pandemic, we're all shut down. And 
there's, you know, none of us can work. And so what happens to those people specifically um, that are going to lose their days towards their union uh, achievement? Now, unfortunately, there's nothing I can do to help you get days uh, towards your union. That you have to do. We've all been there. We've all done it. But, you know, I'm afraid that people are going to get really frustrated and give up because of this pandemic. We've never been through a pandemic before. We've been through, you know, 9-11. We've been through writer strikes. We've been through, you know, uh, the market crashing. But we've never been through something as epic as this. And I kept, you know, saying to myself, what can I do to give back and to help people keep their focus, keep their passion during this time because we honestly don't know how long this is going to go on um some states are going to open up sooner california may not you know we may be a little later but they're working on it so what can i do to keep people focused and motivated especially those that are working towards a career in uh film and television and commercials and you know gathering their days to get into the union. Now, if you're already in the union, unfortunately this doesn't apply to you because you have already done the, you know, the most amazing thing you can possibly do. And that is either be on a show that flipped or get your days, you know, your three years, 60, 60, 60, and you've achieved that. And that is something very special that no one can take away from you. During this time, I've developed this eight week project. It's from June, the month of June and the month of July. So it goes till the end of July. And I've asked nine of my friends who are also very accomplished uh, makeup artists that in the union that you all know of um, to help me with this mentors project. So the people that I have lined up, I've got um, my list here. I have myself. I have Bill Corso, who you know from like Deadpool films and Star Wars and all the Jim Carrey movies, uh, who is an absolutely amazing, brilliant artist. Oh, good. Here's the here's everybody. Um, you have the power couple of our business, Aaron Kruger McCash and Mike McCash, who are uh, in charge of like American Horror Story, the Project Hollywood that Michael just talked about. Um, what else? Uh, Versace, you know, they are two of the most amazing makeup artists you could ever work with. Um, we have V. Neal, of course, who is, you know, the brilliant V. Neal. Um, you know her from Pirates, you know her from uh, Hunger Games and Beetlejuice. I mean, Mrs. Doubtfire, I could go on and on. Um, you have uh, Tim Buchanan, who is an amazing makeup artist with a lot with uh, ethnic skin. Um, did a show called House of Lies, did Black Panther, a movie called Us, which was very, very popular. You have the amazing and beautiful Kim Green, who is doing a show now called Dead to Me, uh, that's airing now on Netflix. Uh, she also did Baywatch, she's done Charlie's Angels. Um, she and I also go way back. Um, all of these people I've known for, for years. Um, next, I have Richard Redlison, who worked with me on Twin Peaks. Um, he's also uh, on Picard, that new Star Trek show. Um, he is a great, great makeup artist. He, as I called him, my triple threat. Um, you have the beautiful Selena Miller, who is based out of 798, uh, who also works quite a bit with V on uh, Edward Scissorhands and uh, Hunger Games and all of those projects in Atlanta. She has a, an amazing career. And then last but not least, you have Jake Garber who is one of my dearest friends. And he uh, did the, he keyed all the uh, special effects for like six seasons of The Walking Dead, uh, which is no small feat. And then also does quite a few of uh, Quentin's movies, uh, Django Unchained, and he also did Star Trek First Contact. Um, so here is, you know, an amazing group of artists that I am so grateful to when I, told them about this project, they all said, um, sign me up, I will be there. So basically what the deal is, is that you're gonna send an email 
to uh, an, it's called the mentors project at yahoo.com. Uh, mentors is plural. And you're going to submit an email that says why you are looking for a mentor, where you are in your career, uh, how many union days you have, what you've been doing to get towards your union status and joining, and uh, you know what you see or how you see your career going. And, and you have to also submit some photos of your work because that way we can see where you are in your uh, progress. So my main reason for doing this was we're, we have quite a bit of downtime right now. And let's say you were uh, called to do a job where you had to do something that you felt might have been out of your comfort zone. If you turn down that job, there's a day of union going towards your union work that you've now just passed up on. And I'm trying to, to save those people so that we don't lose them. Um, and you're not falling off of, you know, where you want to be in your career. So what we're trying to do with this project is to help you with your skill level so that when we get out of this, you know, work pause um, and go back to work, you will have the skills and uh, the ability to really up your game. And that's what this project is. And it was funny because I have to read this to you. This was my horoscope today. Um, it says, we start the week off with the moon in Capricorn. And I'm a Capricorn, which means the emotional tone for this week is of Capricorn's desire to make long-term plans, invest in your future, and see if we are being responsible, mature, professional, and committed to our own path and achievements. Wow. So if that doesn't like explain how this project came along, I don't know what does. But this is something that I'm very passionate about. And if we have a lot of people that are sending in emails, more so than I can just pick 10, um, then I will uh, also call more of my friends more makeup artists to see if I can, you know, gather more uh, mentors. So this will basically be one hour a week. Um, you will, uh, I'm going to vet all of the emails. I'm going to forward those emails specifically to specific mentors that I think will match up well together. They will pick their one person that they are going to mentor and you will have uh, eight weeks. You will have one hour a week at least if they choose and have the time and you guys can do more than an hour a week. That's completely up to you and to your mentor. Um, you can do anything from uh, having an assignment like they'll give you an assignment like Dick Smith used to do and you can take photos of the work. You can do makeup on yourself. You can do it on somebody you may be quarantined with. Um, you cannot break any of the social distancing rules. That is really important. I want to stress that uh, because I don't want anyone putting themselves into any harm's way during this time and possibly, you know, coming into uh, connection with somebody that may have, you know, been infected. So you want, I want you to be really clear on that. Um, and this is something that you can create your own relationship with with these mentors and you can say hey i'm i'm you know really not comfortable with doing a bald cap or can you help me through that um can you help me with chemicals um because i'm doing a sculpture right now and i want to make uh i, I want to pour it up and and you know i, I want to be able to do this myself can you help me you know through that process um it can be beauty makeups it can be facial hair it can be anything that you and your mentor talk about and want to up your skill game and be better at. And also, if I were you, I would talk about what the new normal is going to look like when we do get back to work so that you're prepared. So, um, Michael, I don't know if anybody sent in any questions by email. No, the, I'll check those later and we'll follow up. Okay. This, but I did have one about the project, Debbie. So just, um, just as an update for everyone, we you, all those the email who the mentors are what you have to do to receive it 
um, or to be applying for this mentorship um, will be emailed out and also will be, there's a PDF I'll post on TPG Pro like in 20 minutes, not even. So yeah. you'll get that. And it'll be on my uh, Instagram as well. Exactly. And this is not open only to TPG Pro. Of course, it's open to the industry. If you've got a friend who you know is working toward their union hours or is just in working toward TV and film and hasn't even begun that process yet, right. you know, these are, these are important moments. And for me, I just want to say, you know, Debbie and I have been friends for years. <laughs> um, and, and she is truly, as is V, as is Aaron, as is everybody on that list of mentors, so generous and so amazing to our, the Powder Group community and to the community at large and such great talents. So number one, thank you for being here with us today, but also thank you for out of nowhere, for no reason other than to help others, taking your time, your energy to create this program that you now have to do a lot more work on over the next two months while people are going through this. So um, everyone on this call knows that the Powder Group is about community and giving uh, caring as much about other people's success as your own. And I think that you are just the epitome and the, the, the poster child right now for, for what that means. So thank, thank you for doing this. And, and before we hang up, I'm going to unmute us all so we can all say thank you to Debbie. That's very so funny. Unmuted. Can we just say thank you to Debbie? Thank you. Thank you. Oh my God. Thank you, Michael. Thank you, Debbie. And then hang up. Thank you. Thank you, Michael. Thank you, Michael. Thank you so much. Michael. And Debbie, thank you. We love you. And bye, everybody. Bye, Michael. Thank you, Debbie.